Welcome to Savvy Business Radio. This is your host, Christina Nichman. Each week on Savvy, we support individuals and successful individuals in sharing their expertise, knowledge, tips, and stories with the world. Find out how to sell your business for an outrageous price with Kevin M. Short today. He is the best-selling author of Sell Your Business for an Outrageous Price, an insider guide to getting more than you ever thought. Find out more and get his book today at thinkoutrageous.com. Our second guest, Steve Garko, president of Foresight Business Consulting, joins us today to share how to make strategic decisions for your company's long-term success. He is also the author of Stratification, How Strategic Decision Process Will Create Sustainable Competitive Advantage. Find out more about Steve at stevegarko.com. Hi, Kevin. Welcome to Savvy Business Radio. How are you? I'm great, Christina. It's nice to be here. Well, I'm very, very happy to have you. We've never talked on this topic before, but you are an, uh, an investor. You help businesses get ready to help sell their businesses and, and find investors that are interested in buying their business. So anyone out there who's now maybe starting a business or has been out of there a couple of years and said, okay, what do I have to do if I ever want to sell my business, you'd be the person to come to. But before we go there, share with our audience a little bit about how you got to doing all this and helping entrepreneurs get ready to sell their business. Absolutely. Uh, so I've been working with the owners of privately held companies for about 30 years, uh, helping them get ready to sell and actually taking them to market and selling them. Uh, so, and I, 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 while I was starting in that industry, of, it was called investment banking or uh, merger and acquisition advisory. Um, I was, I also own companies and invest in companies. So I see it from both sides of the, of the same coin. I, as an owner, I, I know how difficult it is to sell. I know how difficult it is to think about selling um, because it's hard to get objective advice. And that's always been important to me without paying a fortune. Yeah. So uh, that kind of prompted me, that's what pushed me into expanding my M&A uh, practice. And, and today I now represent owners of companies all over the country. So there really are no boundaries as to who I represent and who I help. Uh, along the way, so, so mm -hmm. the, the traditional M&A merger and acquisition deal, uh, you know, you hire the investment banker, the investment banker builds a book about your company, meaning an offering memorandum. Mm -hmm. uh, you go to market and you solicit offers for the company. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what I learned um, almost the hard way about 15 years ago uh, when I took a deal out to market and happened to be in a fairly uh, low-key business, nothing sexy about it at all, they were in the metal uh, processing business, so, you know, not, not too fancy. Uh, when we took it to market, the offers came in at about a four multiple of the uh, EBITDA, which mm. is the earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. Mm -hmm. So EBITDA is the term that's used in deal making uh, to uh, assess how much uh, money a company actually makes, because mm -hmm. because your your taxable profit can be misleadingly low often. Mm. Uh, so that's why everyone uses that EBITDA. Uh, term in that math. Uh, so every all the buyers had grouped around about a four multiple of the EBITDA. We had one buyer who offered an eight. Mm. So that was, was a complete surprise to us. We literally thought they had made a mistake. Uh, <laughs> we were smart enough not to mention that to them, and we kept going through the process and closed the deal. Mm. Uh, and, and they paid the eight multiple. I ran into the, and I had no inkling at all why they paid the eight. So I ran into the buyer six months later. Uh, it was a publicly held company was the buyer. Mm -hmm. uh, my client was a family owned, privately held. And I said, what's going on? How's it going? Mm -hmm. And because I was a little concerned how he might feel because now he's probably figured out he paid twice what he had to. Yeah. Uh, and he said, it's going great. We, uh, if, if you have any other companies like that for sale, we would like to buy them, which caught me by surprise. Huh. And I, I said, so what's going on? He said, well, you know, we closed the one plant, and we merged it in with one of ours. We put some of their proprietary products down through our channels worldwide. We put some of our proprietary products down through their channels and some other efficiencies. Mm -hmm. He said, we have made all of our money back in six months. So 
I thought I had sold it for an eight multiple. And the multiples uh, basically imply uh, one year's earnings. So mm -hmm. an eight multiple means, in effect, you've sold it for eight years of earnings, yeah. which is pretty good. I learned I had sold it for six months of earnings wow. because of what they did with the business. And mm -hmm. that's why selling businesses is so different than any other uh, adventure you'll try like this. You know, selling your house, you know pretty much what it's worth. Selling a business, nobody knows what it's worth to a specific buyer. And that, that began mm -hmm. the journey that ended up in the book. Uh, so over that 15-year period, I uh, just uh, I began to think about this a lot as to keep my eyes open for deals where the multiple was dramatically higher and doing lots of research and investigation as to why does a buyer pay an eight multiple when everybody else is going to pay a four. Mm -hmm. So five years before the book was published, uh, I began actually writing the book and digging into it because it's hard to explain. Mm -hmm. The book today goes into great detail about uh, why a, a buyer does that. And, and the value to your listeners, I think, mm -hmm. about this, this whole subject is if you understand what a buyer's thinking about when they're looking at your company, you now know you, you've got your roadmap on how to prepare your business so that when you're ready to sell, you are going to be a candidate for the outrageous price, which is uh, the name of the book. Well, I love uh, that. Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, I was, <laughs> it's a little bit out there. But the uh, publisher thought it was a good idea. So I, no, it is that because uh, I mean we've uh, you've probably watched our tank is a, a good portion of mm -hmm. America has, and it, it looks like good entertainment. But for me, it's a, I love negotiating, and it's a really good lesson on good negotiating. And sometimes I see some people walk in there with business plans, and it's more like they have an emotional attachment to their business where it's my baby, and they lose sight of the practicality and where are the investors seeing or the opportunity you're not seeing the opportunity with my business. And they're right. like, well, it's valued at a million. I'm like, where did you get that number? And sometimes right. their sales or what they're saying they're making in profit doesn't match what they think they're valuing their business at. So wh where do you begin? If, say you've been in business for five years, you are starting to make a profit. Where do you begin to figure out what your value is for your business today and projected value in, say, a year yep. to five years? Yep, great question. So in the book, it lays out four pillars. Uh, the, you need to have these four pillars, and you need to uh, quantify each one of them to to learn where you're at on the path to getting this kind of money. Mm -hmm. uh, underneath all this, the outrageous price we define as getting two times or more the average multiple for your industry. So if you're if companies in your industry are selling for a four multiple, an outrageous price is eight or more. Um, so let's walk through the four pillars. Uh, the first pillar that you need to examine uh, is your competitive advantages. What are you doing differently than your competitors uh, that is important, meaning it makes extra profit, and it's sustainable. It's not just you. It's you've built a system, uh, you have a product, uh, you have a customer base, et cetera, et cetera, that is very valuable. So you, so you need to go through and figure out your competitive advantages. The whole concept of competitive advantage, by the way, and we talk about this in the book, uh, Michael Porter from Harvard is the one who coined the term, and there's a lot written about it to help you think about what competitive advantages are. I find most businesses don't know what their competitive advantages are. Mm. Uh, so that's number one. That becomes your foundation. And what would be uh, some examples of, say, a competitive, and do you, can you think of a company that had a competitive yeah, sure. advantage? Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, the truth is, uh, almost always you have a competitive advantage, or mm. else they wouldn't buy from you. Um, <laughs> So it's, and entrepreneurs often don't think about that because they're so busy covering payroll and, you know, staying in business, they don't realize the competitive advantages that they have or they could have. Uh, so we've had uh, clients who are excellent at marketing, and they own their whole geography. We just, we just did a deal out in Utah uh, in the electrical supply business, which is, again, not a very sexy business. Um, and... At the, we thought it was going to go for a four multiple. Uh, it actually went for uh, an 11 multiple. Mm. Uh, so because they had done a great job of locking up all the major business in Utah, every major contractor uh, and buyer of those kinds of parts bought from them. Mm. 
Mm. And and these the big the big outfits that are multi billion dollars have been trying to get into Utah for a long time, and they couldn't. So when the bidding started on the company, when we asked for everyone to make their offer, we thought it was going to be around twenty million dollars, and it ended up at forty three million dollars because they wanted it. So what the, what the buyer what mm. you have to think about is the buyer knows what they're going to do with the business. Mm-hmm. That's critical to absorb because they will not tell you, they will never give you an inkling of what they're going to do with it because that is their advantage in the negotiations. Mm-hmm. They, we, we have had buyers um, that have said, you know, at the end of the day, everybody else in that industry was paying a five. If we had paid a 15, we didn't care because we were going to make so much more money because of the other synergies in our business, we could have gone all the way up to a 15 multiple and still made a lot of money. Now, they don't tell you that during the deal, of course. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, but you, that's, that's where all this, uh, the synergies develop, is what that buyer, that specific buyer, not buyers in general, mm-hmm. that specific buyer. So the second pillar is, is the buyer. Mm-hmm. Uh, you've got to do your homework uh, mm-hmm. up front before you go to market and to develop the short list of players who could uh, pay the price. And so mm-hmm. they've got to be big. Uh, if it's if you're a ten million dollar company and you're selling to a ten million dollar company, they by definition cannot pay you an outrageous price because mm-hmm. because they're not going to have the cash to do it. So that means they have to go to a bank or to their investors, and a bank or the investors will never support the concept of paying twice what a business is generally worth. Right. Mm-hmm. So the only way you're going to get that is from the billion dollar player who has so much synergy going for them with this acquisition, mm-hmm. uh, they can fund it out of their uh, cash reserves within the company and pay it because they really don't care. They don't have to justify it to anybody other than folks on the, in- on the inside. So you've got to identify that outrageous buyer. Mm-hmm. Uh, we also talk a lot in the book about how to identify them and then how to court them. The fact that you're a, multi, you know, a few million dollars of sales, mm-hmm. how do you get the attention of IBM? If IBM is your best buyer, you figure it out. Mm-hmm. Well, we talk about ways to do that. Uh, we want you going to trade shows. We want you meeting the people in the booth. We want you communicating with them. We want you to, to have them in your uh, email database mm-hmm. so they see everything you're doing. Mm-hmm. And you do, that, you do that as far up front as you can. Um, the third pillar is the can seller. Can I stop you right there? Because that, sure. that's very interesting. I think that advice you just gave is really valuable, not just when you're ready to go to marketplace to sell your business, but I've, I've worked with businesses because I've done financial consulting and walked in and helped businesses with their cash flow issues regarding accounts receivable. And um, one of the biggest mistakes I see small businesses make is taking contracts and deals with businesses who uh, they shouldn't, they should have not be working with them because frank, quite frankly, they can't afford to. And they're taking big contracts. And I said, did you get 50% down? Did you work out a deal? They're like, no, they'll pay them once we make the product. I mean, you don't know if they are going to be able to pay them. So um, right. that's something to look into when you even get clients, when your business is starting to work on contracts with businesses. Do you have any right working with them? Can they even afford to pay you the contract? Are you doing proper credit checks on them to see are they something – can you work together and not have a hit at the end of the day? Right. It's yeah. critical. And one, in, to your point, one of the keys is you want to have personal contacts as far up the chain as you can. Mm-hmm. So in your, in your example, you can pick up the phone and say, um, you know, Mary, we did this work and delivered it. It's yeah. now been 68 days. Uh, can you check on our payment? Yeah. Uh, the higher up the chain you can go. So always be developing those contacts. Always be doing your competitive intelligence mm-hmm. uh, so that when it becomes valuable, those people know who you are. Yeah, and, and also you mentioned checking their behavior. What we do, and I've had companies do, is really do a credit check on whoever you're working with every six months. So you take their bank information and stuff at the start of negotiations, and you have it on file, and you recheck. I mean, if you notice that they're having a dodge down in, in uh, the amount of finances in their bank for three to six months, and, and they're really living on their um, credit, that, that's really dangerous. You want to offer them a $150,000 contract at that point. Um, right. So those are the same questions you'd be looking at if, if you're looking for an investor, I would think, as well, just to pay attention to their whole, you know, way of behaving in the market. I mean, how are they operating? Are they having problems keeping up on their own finances or paying their own bills and all that jazz? Correct. And you know, it, so part of it is watching their behavior. Part of it is creating awareness so they know who you are at the top level when 
uh, when there's an issue going on. The, the third component of that uh, buyer pillar is that you want to keep an eye on them. Let's say you're in the southeast and you're, you cover the southeast with your sales force, mm -hmm. and you just you just heard through the grapevine that uh, the big mega company just lost its entire sales force for the southeast. They walked out the door. Mm -hmm. Well, that might be the time to position yourself in front of them and get them because you want them to call you. You don't want to call them and say, hey, I've got a great opportunity for you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you the opportunity to pay me twice what I'm worth. That, that doesn't work. Mm -hmm. It doesn't work at all. You need them to call you. Mm -hmm. uh, but in that case, they may be more open to the whole concept of buying and may not care what they have to pay because they just they now have this problem. Mm -hmm. So keep it. That's why you want to keep an eye on on these sellers, um, and on these on these buyers. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. The third pillar is the seller themselves. Um, when you're trying to get twice what everybody else is getting in your industry, that's a pretty high stakes poker game. And one of the things that we will talk about a lot with our clients is: Are they built to be in that poker game, or is it just going to make them? too nervous. Mm. Uh, so you, you need to know yourself. You need to know if you can trust your advisors because th the fourth pillar is do you have the right advisors that can help you through this process, folks that know how to negotiate, folks that know how to uh, rationalize and support asking for twice the value, um, et cetera, et cetera. So three and, uh, three and four are about the seller and about the team that they've built. That's very, very important. Yeah. So those are the four pillars of what you've got to do to get prepared. Uh, and, and what we say to entrepreneurs all the time is we know this, not, this may not be the time to go to market, mm -hmm. but it is the time to work on it, to work on your company. You may get to the other, the other end of the road and sell, and you may not get an outrageous price, but because you've, prayed, you've paid, uh, prepared for it, you would get a lot more money, and the sale will go a lot uh, mm -hmm. easier and cleaner. Yeah. So there's no downside to trying to get ready for the outrageous price. Yeah, yeah, I can totally see that. And also I've seen and, and I've seen on, on uh, Shark Tank when people have been up there negotiating, some people get a bit sweaty and you can see them sweating uh, on both sides of their face as they're like, oh, no, the questions are getting hard. And, and that's what you were mentioning. Do you not only have the right team of advisors to negotiate properly, but if you're the one out there in front, are you able to handle the tough questions coming your way? Because, as you said, this is a really tough game. And I've heard it on Shark Tank that you're valuing your company at, say, $2 million. I saw you had XYZ sales. How are you going to prove to me that you're valued at XYZ? And they're like, right. you know, it's a, it's a little scary because they want to try to call you out that you're trying to make me pay four times <laughs> what you're worth. Uh, are you coming here to rip me off? And that's what I just saw in the last Shark Tank I watched. The guy just said straight out, are you coming here to rip us all out, off up here? <laughs> and the guy was just in there like, uh, <laughs> deer caught in the headlights. <laughs> right. Yeah. You better be prepared for those kinds of accusations and questions and be matter of fact about it or you lose your price. Exactly, exactly. So say um, you're, you're getting started, but you have the overall plan, say in five to ten years, that I want to set my business up to sell. Um, how do you set it up so that it's even attractive to anyone out there to want to buy it at ground one? Is it really, like, now you mentioned a little bit in the beginning that you really have to know your target audience and, and how you're helping them. What is your, your unique um, strategy in the world that you're giving that no one else is, but is there anything else that businesses can do to make sure they're ready and prepared? Uh, I think it's important to know who you are and who you're mm -hmm. not. Um, have an objective. The entrepreneurs are not famous for objectivity, of course. <laughs> uh, they put their head down and run through walls. Mm -hmm. While you're running through walls, be sure that you're keeping an eye on what is it that you're doing that is important. And mm -hmm. if it's not, you Better, you better add that to the to the list uh, because if you're just like everybody else, you're going to get a price like everybody else. Uh, so keep an eye on what you can do differently or better. Uh, it, can, it can be managing people. It can be sales and marketing systems that you've figured out. Mm -hmm. uh, but you've got to do that. You've got to do that every step of the way. Be thinking about what are we doing that's different, what are we doing that's better. Uh, would this work on a worldwide platform? Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah. always be thinking about it. You, you know, you, I'm sure you talk often about working on your business versus in, and this is one of those key issues that you have to work on is what makes you different and better, and can we, can we uh, leverage that across a larger company?
Yeah. And what's, what worked tremendously well for my business and for me, personal growth and business growth, is having a business mentor, which I worked with early on in starting my business. And, and she basically uh, would always say to me, what makes you different? What makes you stand out from, say, anyone else doing what you're doing? Because there's a lot of financial consultants out there helping people with cash flow. What makes you different? And I, it was like driving me crazy. I'm like, I don't know. I, I'm good at it. You know? and, and she wouldn't let me off the hook until I could give her a clear answer and looking back at all the huge corporations, mid-sized corporations I've worked with, the one thing I noticed that I, I kept getting back from feedback was that your customer service was par, bar none. I mean, that I would get the customers I worked with, the big corporations, their customers to feel like I, I was doing them a favor by getting their cash flow issues resolved. And uh, so I said, it's customer service. I am an expert in, in customer service and helping customers build that extreme quality customer service that makes customers want to give them their money. And, and she said, that's it then, and that's what you got to run with. And so it was, it was really beneficial to me to having that to stand on to say, here's how I'm going to help your business and why, and why I'm different from other financial consultants out there. Yeah, you, you got excellent advice. Having the mentor, having somebody who's smart enough and tough enough to call you out uh, is important because entrepreneurs, like I said, uh, put their head down and run through walls. They're not open to advice very often. Mm. It's critical that you've got somebody who's really good at this and, and objective. Yes, yes. And if need be, maybe even hire you or your business because it's great to have an outside perspective, whether it be a business coach or an investor, if you are thinking of going that route, to help you be objective. Um, it is hard to stay objective because, like I've heard from a lot of business owners, uh, regardless of where they're at in their business, that they, they, oh, it's my baby. And I used to say that early on, and my partner used to be like, it's not, it's not a baby, it's a business. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Right. It, it drove them crazy to hear that, and, and it's true. You want to be objective. Um, you want to be able to stand back and see things clearly, and not be clouded by this is my baby. I put my blood, sweat, and tears into it, and say yes, you might have, but still, you have to be able to look at what's working, what's not working, where are you now, and where do you want to be. Yep. Great advice. You're right yeah, on. Absolutely. Absolutely. So what have you seen working with, say, a client comes to you as some of the faux pas you've seen them make with negotiating or setting up their business for selling? Well, they don't think about it until <laughs> something, just some catalytic moment. Um, they lose their best customer. They lose their, their top salesperson. Mm -hmm. uh, their lender goes away. There's a lot of this back in 08 and 09. Uh, the, you know, the lender went away, and now they had to train a, a new lender, and they, that stress got to them. Mm -hmm. um, so we see lack of preparation as the number one problem. Um, so in our world, it's it's your fundamental preparation, and then preparation for the for the big sale. So I would be thinking about that all the time. I would begin to form the team early: your attorney, your accountant, mm -hmm. your investment banker. Um, so people call us all the time and, and say, well, what do you think? Am mm -hmm. I prepared? Do, am, am I doing the right things? And we don't charge them for that. We just listen to them, talk to them, mm -hmm. probe a little bit, because uh, we're trying to find that competitive advantage. Uh, there's a fair amount of uh, conversation in the book that talks about how to find it. But if you're still struggling with it, you know, call me and we can uh, talk about it. But that's, it's really important to prepare mm -hmm. Uh, and, and be comfortable with that. So th those are some of the things that I've seen. Um, I've seen other people uh, not be prepared at all, and mm -hmm. they decide to go to market, and it's just, it's just not pretty. It's, mm -hmm. uh, and any of the fundamentals, their books are not in shape. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a client one time who had a drywall business uh, that he represented to us that made $6 million a year profit. Mm -hmm. And I said, great, then that should sell pretty easily. And when we dug into it, we noticed that his inventory was the same every year. And we're like, well, how does that happen? And, you know, obviously he was cooking the books to make sure the inventory stayed low. So his, his um, margins, his, his inventory was, it was every, all over the lot, mm -hmm. never accurate. And so mm -hmm. as a result, we, we could never represent any particular period as being accurate. And I said to him, um, I know you did this to save taxes. But every dollar of uh, profit you didn't show uh, is going to cost you five dollars in price, which mm -hmm. you know took took his breath away, of course, because uh, he had he had hidden you know over a million dollars a year of profit. Mm -hmm. um, so 
but he wasn't getting good advice. You know, we, we see that a lot, that entrepreneurs run their companies to lower income taxes, mm -hmm. uh, but it costs them a fortune when they go to sell. So you've got to have that good team. You've mm -hmm. got to have an attorney who understands mergers and acquisitions. Mm -hmm. Mergers, because when you think about selling, you're, you're up against a team. The buyer team does this every day of the week. They are very experienced at buying. They know all the tricks and the traps. This is not like selling your house. There's no comparison at all. Uh, selling your house, the documents are, you know, half an inch thick. Mm -hmm. Often in the sale of a, a company, they're two feet thick. Oh. And so you better understand all those documents and what they all mean and how they all weave together. Otherwise, you end up giving back a lot of the money after close yeah. if you don't have the right attorney. You'll, you, you'll be taking a heavy loss in some cases. One one company Absolutely. I worked, yeah, one company I worked with said the same thing. Your company was saying that he was really in a great profits coming in, whatever. And I just need you to just firm things up a little bit, get my staff trained, and get the AR working a little better. And I came in and realized, you know, because it's a two-sided coin, you can't just look at the AR and not look at the payables. And uh, the payables was uh, absurd. There was way more leaving the company than coming in. And I said, have you looked at both sides of the equation here? This is really, really bad. You've got to find a way to uh, make it so that your payables aren't going as more, way more than what you're bringing in. And he said, well, we've, we're doing it just the way we're doing it. We're not changing anything. I said, well, then I'm leaving because there's no reason for me to be here. I'm not going to be able to help you. But right. so you, I think as an entrepreneur, you, you have to be really ready to take advice, um, hire the right people, as you said. I think an attorney right out of the gate is very important, at least to have an advisor as attorney and, and a good accountant. And, and, and I like what Donald Trump said when he said, you know, when you have an accountant, make sure you have an accountant for your accountant. <laughs> right. That's right. Because a lot That's of right. accountants. Yeah, yeah. yeah, particularly when you get into the tax arena. Mm -hmm. uh, so the world we live in, these deals get taxed heavily when you sell. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're, so one of the preparation uh, topics is income taxes. There are lots of things you can do if you plan ahead that lower that income tax bill at closing a huge amount. You can cut it in half if you've prepared. Um, but you better, do it off, you better do it early, and you better have tax advice from the best and the brightest, because uh, mm -hmm. tax code is very complex around mergers and acquisitions. You don't yeah. want to get bad advice because you end up giving it back plus penalties and interest. Yes, absolutely. And you also mentioned something very good that um, some companies really don't have a handle on their numbers, period. Uh, and like the case of this guy who didn't know what was going out or in, didn't really have a handle on them either. Um, and that's very important when you want to get ready not only to sell, but just to keep a um, profitable business going. You, that will put you under in no time, not having a clear understanding what's coming in and out. And also having that clear understanding, where am I now? Where do I want to go? And say, okay, I have a sales team of five people. I uh, presumably want to grow and continue to grow, what is that going to look like as far as uh, money I have to put out to keep it running? And uh, what if one of my team, like my best sales rep, because some of the companies I work with, generally it's one or two people on the sales team that's really running the whole sales department, really keeping things running. If one of those two people go, what happens with you know the company on a whole? How does that affect the whole? Yeah, you know, yeah. A good point you're raising, because underneath that there's an issue that we often have to deal with in these privately owned companies. If there's a key employee, let's say your top sales rep uh, controls a lot of your best customers, but, she, but, but she's a non-owner. Mm -hmm. uh, the way this plays out, we call them hostage situations. Let's say it's a week before closing uh, and I'm buying your company. And I, you know, through all my due diligence, I determined that Mary's your top salesperson uh, I'm going to say to you a week before closing, you know, we're ready to close next week. Uh, we're going to give you your $10 million bucks in cash. Mm -hmm. Great company, beloved. We do need to sit down and talk to Mary and, and assure her that life is going to go on just the way it is today because it's important to us that Mary's happy. Mm. We, sit down with, we sit down with Mary in the conference room say, Mary, isn't this exciting? Christina's going to get $10 million bucks next Friday. Isn't that cool? And mm. we want you, you're so important to us. We want to give you an employment contract with a non-compete mm -hmm. uh, for five years. Mm -hmm. Now, Mary should say, well, wait, wait, okay, thank you. Let me think about that. She walks out of that conference room, goes down to your office and say, wait a minute, Christina, when I joined you, you weren't making any money. Now you're making enough money that they're going to give you $10 million bucks. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's all on my back. I, I'm the one who made all that money for you. Mm -hmm. uh, here's, what, 
Here, here's how it's going to go, Christina. You either give me a million bucks next Friday out of your proceeds, or I quit because I get job offers every week. I quit, and I'm going someplace else. Whoa. So that happens. We, we, we call them our hostage situations. She's mm -hmm. going to hold you hostage to get what she wants. And now you're within a week of closing. There's not much you can do. So mm -hmm. what, we, what we always advise uh, the owners to do is put into place a stay bonus agreement with every key employee. Now, key is defined as somebody that could affect the deal, that a buyer is going to insist on meeting, because we generally don't like employees to know that a company's for sale while we're at market. Mm -hmm. So it has to be somebody that's key uh, and extremely valuable. And so if you in, in, a, in a business that's doing $10 million or less, there's probably one to three people that fit that definition. Mm -hmm. And so what you want to do is go to them before you go to market and say, you know, Laura, we're going to market. Um, we've decided to sell for, you know, good reasons. I want to make sure you're taken care of. So I'm going to give you a stay bonus agreement in writing. Mm -hmm. uh, it's going to give you an amount of money in three different payments, mm -hmm. a payment the day of closing, a payment a year later, and a payment two years later. What we've tried to do is design it in such a way that Laura doesn't have to worry about losing her job because that's the first thing every employee thinks about when a company sells is they're going to lose their job, and now they won't be able to pay their mortgage or their kids' college costs. So the stay bonus agreement is going to give them the money in case they lose their job uh, that will give them their transition to their next job or next career. It works wonders. And so that employee now is in the, is in the loop. Mm -hmm. uh, they know they're going to be rewarded for helping with the sale, and they no longer have to worry about holding the deal hostage to protect themselves. So mm -hmm. it, has, it has eliminated uh, the issue for us. If, if any of your listeners want a copy of that agreement to give their attorney, uh, just have them reach out to me, and we'll shoot them a copy of that. So wow. it's, it's, worked, it's worked wonders. That's, a, that's fabulous advice, very important advice. And, and it's interesting because I've been part of quite a few businesses that did go to market, and, and it was just that kind of dreaded feeling throughout the entire company, not just with the key employees, but with everyone thinking, okay, when the new management comes, are we all out of a job? And, and it's kind of low morale. And, and that's dangerous for the entire company because every, even if you're not a key employee, all of the employees as a whole keep the business running, and they're very necessary. So um, I, I was often in the manager, managerial role, like how do we keep the, um, the morale up so that everyone wants to keep coming to work <laughs> and is really excited right. that this is a good thing. This is not bad. This is going to be good for us. It's going to bring more money in, more opportunities for everyone here. So, you know, don't be alarmed. But, yeah, it's a tough call for everyone, but that's a really, really awesome advice for uh, owners out there. It's important it's in three payments. That's, that was the big change because you've heard of stay bonus agreements where people get rewarded for staying till close. Well, that's almost counterproductive because the buyer worries that employee just got a bonus. They may leave now. Yeah. So that's why, we, that's why we split it into three payments to make sure the employee stays for a couple of years. That's a great idea. Yeah, that's, that, I've never heard that before in the three installments. That's a great idea. Anyone listening in, take notes. Well, you know, this has been so fascinating having you join us here, Kevin. I want to thank you again for coming to share this very valuable information um, on Savvy Business Radio. Uh, what would be your final words of advice for any business owner ready to go to market? I think it's preparation. Build your team. Do not ever talk to a buyer. Don't ever mm -hmm. give them any information or have them visit until – you know what they're willing to pay for a business like yours. Always keep this, the buyer on their heels. That's critical. Yeah, I was going to say, before you go, please don't go without letting them know where they can find out more about yeah. you, your book, <laughs> and work with you and your company if need be. Where can they do that? The easiest way to learn more about the book is uh, thinkoutrageous.com is the website for the book. And my website is claytoncapitalpartners.com. Fabulous. Well, again, I want to thank you, Kevin, for sharing today on Savvy Business Radio. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Christina. Now, here's our interview with Stephen Gocko, author of Stratification, How Strategic Decision Processes Will Create Sustainable Competitive Advantage. Hi, Steve. Welcome to Savvy Business Radio. How are you this wonderful Saturday afternoon? I'm doing great. How are you doing, Christina? I'm doing wonderfully and very happy to have you out here. We're going to talk about a very important topic that I don't think we really hit on too often on Savvy Business Radio, and that is strategy and, and, and really having a good strategic plan for your business. 
before we go there and talk about all of your great wisdom, share with the audience how you came to working and helping small businesses. Well, first, Christina, I'm honored to be on your show. Thank you very much. And um, I'm president of Foresight Business Consulting, a Chicago-based strategy and marketing firm. And I'm also a professional business speaker. I'm obsessed with making a difference in the way companies form strategic decisions. And I believe that any company can significantly improve performance by implementing a defined strategic decision process, including my own proprietary process, the Lean Strategic Decision Model. Mm -hmm. I started as a market researcher, eventually building my career by assuming greater marketing and general management responsibility. Then as VP of Global Marketing for a Fortune 300 company, I became intimately involved in strategy formation. And as leader of a multidisciplinary task force established to select the next generation portfolio for one of our half billion dollar franchises, I recognized the need to develop a new decision approach. I developed a process to overcome the team's problems of incomplete issue framing, of inadequate decision criteria identification, endless data collection, and detrimental group dynamics. And then using this structured approach, my team successfully forged the new franchise. Mm -hmm. Now after that, uh, I uh, spent a few stints as a senior manager of two startups, and then I launched my consulting uh, company. Uh, I'm currently um, author of two books, the most mm -hmm. recent Achieving International Bestseller Status, and that one's titled Str Stratification, How Strategic Decision Processes Will Create Sustainable Competitive Advantage. Now, this book explains the barriers to strategic decision making and techniques that mitigate them. Mm -hmm. uh, since developing LSDM, which is what I call it for short, <laughs> I have presented the model in seminars and successfully implemented LSDM for clients and count many companies as experienced advocates. Hmm. So that's that's me. Wow. And you mentioned something there interesting for me that popped out, um, issue framing on how businesses will, will frame a certain issue or problem, and also uh, maybe excessive reporting. I, I work with a number of um, businesses from very small to very large, helping them with their cash flow issues and account receivable end of their business. But um, interestingly, sometimes I find talking to some of the higher ups that they become super over consumed with metrics and reporting. And instead of looking at the overall like what is going on with my staff like when I say okay I noticed this talking to your staff they're completely not in tuned to what's going on with the general heartbeat sometimes of their employees um, they're kind of so stuck inside the reporting is, is that what you kind of cover in your book when it comes to the reporting aspect well th th that's true I what I talk about a little bit is uh, I have a little bit of a different opinion on strategy and, hmm. and that opinion is is that in order to form great strategy, you don't need to collect mountains of data, and you don't need to analyze and analyze and analyze. And, you know, coming from a big company, I remember seeing all these analyst drones, as I call them, putting together these PowerPoint presentations that are 30, 40, 50 pages long and, and all that. Well, you don't need that to make strategic decision making. Mm -hmm. When I get challenged on that, what I basically ask the executive, I, I say, how much of that 60-page document did you actually consume and learn and, and uh, understand? We're all human. When we're seeing these things uh, coming through us, we drift. We start thinking about what's going to be for lunch and all that. So how much of the stuff do we really <laughs> focus on when we're spending all that time looking at those things? Mm. So. What I try and do is the system is set up to, first of all, take a complex strategic issue, and, and they are complex. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What we do is we try and break them into what I call little bites. And what we do is we analyze one bite here, we analyze another bite, mm -hmm. and then that analysis means that we're not spending hours and hours and hours looking at data. We're not spending hours, you know, watching PowerPoint presentations, we're able to focus and move on. Mm. Now, what we then do is once we've individually done these little analyses, we then have uh, um, something that I call a canvas, which is a two-page document where each one of your small decisions is 
placed on one page, and that allows the executive team to look at the whole issue mm -hmm. in a much more simple manner, and then you can make your decisions based on that. Mm. Wow. So in your research and working with businesses, do most of them make good strategic decisions from your um, perspective? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, no, I don't. And, and quite honestly, it's not just me. Uh, wow. Recent surveys by two large consulting firms indicate that executives themselves do mm -hmm. not think strategy is well performed. Wow. One, one study indicated that over 50% of the surveyed executives felt their strategy would not lead to company success. Which, think about it, that's absolutely amazing. Yeah, know? yeah. What, I mean, because first, what I like to think is, we're all rational people. Executives aren't dumb. But why would we be implementing a strategy that we don't think is going to be successful? That just doesn't make sense. Hmm. And what's interesting is further, two-thirds of these executives indicate that their company's capabilities do not fully support their strategy. Hmm. So, he, I, now, here, here's, I, I, I don't know if you like analogies, but I, I like to think of strategic decision making mm -hmm. as kind of like a corporate sextant. I don't know if you know the word sextant, but that's the tool mm -hmm. that sailors use to plot the course of their ship by looking at the stars. Yes. Okay, and as what happens is, is that while the ship is moving through, and I like to think of these great big sailing ships, you know, from the 1700s, they needed to look at certain points and plot where they were going versus the stars. And that's what I think of as strategic decision making. Strategic decision making is plotting the business's course by coming to a juncture and analyzing an issue and deciding which way it's going forward. Now, here's an interesting thing. Um, another consulting organization basically looked at how people, they asked how they make strategic decisions. And what they said, they do one of two things. Either they develop a portfolio of solutions to their strategic issues and try and implement all of them. Mm -hmm. Or what they do is they pick one, and even if they don't have the capabilities to do it, they figure that they're just going to go ahead and develop those capabilities as they move forward. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know how ridiculous that sounds to you, but let me now bring it back to the analogy, okay? Because yeah. here, here's the deal. The first approach is kind of like being on that ship. And what you do is you, you decide you're going to send all your lifeboats in different directions in order to reach port. Mm. Now, why, what, why do I say that? Ba basically, why is that going to fail? Well, it's going to fail because they have to, Put people in there, the people have to eat, you, you, you just don't know whether you're giving each lifeboat enough resources to get to port. Mm -hmm. Now, the other one is essentially kind of like um, sending someone off, the other one being, you know, we, we, we're going to figure out as we go kind of a thing. It's kind of like sending off a boat without knowing whether or not you need oars, sails, different kinds of sails, a jib, you know, the food. Once again, it's all about resourcing, and that's, that's one of the really troubling things about strategy today. Mm -hmm. What I think is, in, is we're, what we're trying to educate people to do is take the time, do an analysis. It doesn't have to be a forever analysis, but pick the best approach, fully fund it, and you're more likely to reach port than if you take these other approaches. Wow, wow. And we talked earlier, just before the interview, how um, my first business, CQ, failed miserably, and I, I was very disheartened and upset about it. But I now look at this. I, I probably took your second approach there, which is I'll just wing it and go with the flow and see what happens. And really, I took my approach based on seeing the really huge businesses I worked with and tried to follow their model, not realizing, nor do I have... I do not have the resources they have at the moment, and nor am I them. I'm not even doing the same type of work. So um, me saying I'm going to approach um, my decision-making and my business the way they have approached their business doesn't make sense for where I am at the moment. And what I'm really gathering from you and, and what you're saying about strategic 
decision making that it's really understanding really where you are right now, taking a careful every couple months status on where you are and where is your end result? Is it leading you to your end result where you want to take the business? Am I correct in my assumption? Absolutely. And and uh, that that's why it's um, – now, let, let me just I, – I don't want to go off track mm -hmm. a little bit, but what we haven't really talked about yet is what is strategy. And mm -hmm. what, I, what I think is often the case is that many executives think of strategy as this, like, worthless, namby-pamby exercise. <laughs> but the way I look at it is I think of strategy as a planned set of structured actions designed to leverage your company's competencies to drive a better business outcome. Now, this outcome could be a more financial growth or it could be mitigation of some negative environmental event. But see, when you think about it in that light, strategy and forming the appropriate strategy is really powerful. Mm. It's a, it's a, it's, I think it's actually a really awesome exercise just in your personal development and your own life. Where are you now with all of your goals in your own life? Say you're taking it out of the business context. You can apply your lean strategic decision model to all parts of your life and really impact your life for the greater good. Well, I, I suppose you could. Yeah, <laughs> I, yeah. Although I, I've really kind of focused on uh, business strategy and I guess mm -hmm. – the reason is, is that I've seen so many strategic mistakes happen mm -hmm. just with during my own career, and I just had reached a conclusion, now confirmed by these two reports, that companies just don't do uh, strategy uh, or strategic decision making all that well. Companies are great at making operational decisions, these day-to-day -day decisions. So the question comes: Why is it that people are making? Um, really good operational and not great strategic decisions. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a couple of reasons. The, the first, first is, is that when you look at the corporate world today, there is one urgent issue that people need to take care of, the senior executives, and that is hit your financial numbers on a quarterly basis. And I think what happens is, is that we become consumed by that because that is what is going to drive their performance. And quite honestly, nobody gets fired for making a bad strategic decision, but you get fired for not hitting your quarterly numbers. So what are you going to do? You're going to focus on that. Yeah. But, and that, that's why I guess um, I think it's really important to come up with a different approach, which I think I've done. Mm -hmm. We, we can't change the fact that uh, Wall Street is going to demand financial performance. Mm -hmm. But what we do know is that making strategic decisions is going to have a very significant impact down the road. Mm -hmm. So finding a way for executives to, uh, to get the time to make those good strategic decisions mm -hmm. while they're managing their quarterly um, financials is essential in today's business world. Wow, Steve. Uh, you hit on something very interesting, and I had an interesting chat with one of the executives of one of my clients, and we, we talk numbers all the time. It's very important. Now, I deal mostly with helping them with the AR side, the, the bringing the money into the company side, but they're both interchangeable, meaning the AP side is very important. They both interchange, and it's the other side of the coin. You can't look at one without looking at the other. And, 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 of course, looking at sales because they're all intertwined. They're not separate entities. And so I was talking to one of the executives who was telling me, hey, great, you know, we're not bringing enough cash flow. The cash flow is starting to dip extensively in this one area, this one division. And I said to him, you know, I, I see what you're talking about here. But if you look at the whole picture here, I'm noticing that sales has dropped by 80 percent in that same area. So you wow. can't expect that the staff is going to collect more when actually there's less for them to go out and collect. So what are we yeah. going to do about that side of the equation? See, And I think that's what you're getting at when you say businesses are kind of not really good at strategic um, decision making because they're not like this one uh, executive was so focused on that one area she wasn't seeing the whole picture. Like why is it suffering in this one division? Because the whole picture is, mi well we're missing sales. You know, we have to figure out why are sales drip uh, dipping in this this area and figure out what we're going to do about that so that the AR side can bring in more money. 
Now, and here's a here's one thing I often talk about. I mean, we we have been enamored with uh, Facebook for a long time, mm-hmm. and everybody really likes Uber now. <laughs> and, and then you look at um, uh, Amazon. Amazon has been dominating the internet um, sales market for quite some time. Now. What will happen is many executives are going to go, well, what are they doing differently than Mm -hmm. what I'm doing? And uh, what I like to tell them is I think that those people are excellent at um, making strategic decisions and then acting on them. So the only way that these companies have been able to implement disruptive business models is because they take a strategic approach to what they're trying to do. Mm-hmm. So while other executives are focusing on how they can get uh, the price increased 1% or 2% or a 5% market change, mm-hmm. um, these folks are really identifying ways to completely change the market dynamics. So instead of focusing on operational excellence, they're focused on strategic outcomes. Mm-hmm. And that's what I'm trying to get people to think about. You know, when you look at these really successful people, they're not doing it by increasing market share 5%. They're taking a strategic position and changing the market dynamics. Mm. And that seems to me what would come into play to being able to perform that is really looking at the whole picture and asking the right questions. You know, if, if you're, you're not going in the direction you want strategically, why are we not? What, why are we not hitting where we want to go, the direction we want to go? What are the things standing in our way and that we could do differently? Maybe a course correction, a slight course correction in an area so that we can uh, hit where we want to go and end up in the right, um, within the right goals. That, that awareness that you're talking about is really key. Mm-hmm. Now, and one other thing that's really important, because um, once again, if we go back to this research that I was talking about, one of the things they found is that people who are, oh, in fact, let me give, give you a little statistic. Okay. What they did was they, they looked at, uh, I think it was 2,400 executives, and they asked the executives certain questions because they wanted to find out who was making good strategic decisions and who was not making good decisions. And they, they, so they let people identify themselves as they thought they did good. And then what they did is they looked at their profit margin compared to the rest of the industry. And if their profit margin was higher than the industry average, then this organization would say that they, yes, they're doing strategic decision making well and they can demonstrate it. Mm-hmm. Okay, 7% of the respondents could meet those criteria. This is wow. a 2,400 people. Okay. Now, what they went on further to do is they looked at um, what are some of the differences. And the point I wanted to make is this one difference. What they found is is that people who uh, are not part of that 7%, what they typically do when they're trying to form strategy is they look internally. So they look at, okay, what are our sales like? How much do we want them to grow? Mm-hmm. You know, what are our capabilities and things like that? Not bad things to do, mm-hmm. but what what they what the seven percent did, they focused externally. So what they did was they looked at their their um, the environment, what's going on with their customer, what's going on with the competitors, what's Ooh. going on with industry regulation, blah blah blah, that kind of stuff. And so in 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 essence, what they're saying is part of the solution to being good at. Uh, strategy formation and strategic decision making is having an external focus, not an internal focus. Wow, that's something I don't really hear a lot of. Now, we've had a couple guests in the past on Savvy Business Radio talk about the importance of customer service, meaning how are your customers feeling about your product? Are they happy continually? What do you have to do to to have them have that amazing customer service experience? But one thing that's not, I I don't recall ever being focused on in our show is really paying attention to the competition. How does the competition, the marketplace all play into our role in it and, uh, and making it better in whatever field we're in? So when you work with the business as a consultant, how do you begin to have them structure and pay attention to that external force? Essentially what we do is I ask them to implement the nine-step LSDM process. Mm -hmm. And the first thing that we do is we attempt to define the strategic issue. Sometimes companies call me in and they really haven't 
defined the issue well enough. And when you don't define the issue, you can really fumble around and make time, make waste time doing that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's the first step we do. Then the second thing that we do is we focus on what I call identifying the strategic alternatives. Um, and you can think of strategic alternatives as the solutions to your strategic problem. Now at that point, <clears throat> in order to do that, you really need to start looking externally because um, you may hate your competitor, but sometimes your competitor is actually doing some things that are really well that you can learn from and implement, copy, or improve upon. So that would be another thing. The other thing is going out and talking to your customer and finding out what's going on with them and trying to develop solutions that will help you. Once you've identified these alternatives, this is what you're going to be going through for the rest of the process. You're going to be trying to define which of these alternatives, which of these solutions to your issue are you going to implement first or at all. Mm -hmm. uh, now, the next thing that we do is we ask the team to identify what I call decision criteria. Decision criteria are the important factors that you think should be considered when you're moving ahead. So mm -hmm. what would be an example of a decision criteria? Uh, perhaps you've got this new technology that you really are not sure how you're going to implement it yet. So what you might do is you might look at different market sizes. You know, will the electronics market be where I should go? Should I be going into the healthcare market? Something mm -hmm. like that. And so you're defining that. Or you, you may be defining whether the, the structure of your competition is made up of a lot of little players or are there great big behemoths that you can mm -hmm. use So those would be just a couple of examples of the criteria you do. Mm -hmm. And then what happens is, and we're doing all this before we collect data. The next thing we do is we do something that I call setting criteria rankings. And what that is, is you're basically trying to set up three, point, three points, if you will, for each criteria that you're going to use for your decision. You want to identify what would be a good outcome bad outcome or neutral outcome. Mm -hmm. So for example, okay, if I decide that market size is something I'm going to look at, I may decide that um, in, if I'm going to rank something is good, that the market size has to be $800 million per year. Mm -hmm. uh, if it's bad, I will consider it bad if it's $200 million or less. Mm -hmm. And then if it's between 200 and 800, then I'm kind of neutral. And, and so basically what we're doing is we're giving um, a rubric that your decision makers can use to define whether or not uh, where, where the strategic alternative fits within your analysis. Kind of a set point of, of source. And then you collect the data. And then what we do is we use that data to actually assign these rank rankings that I've talked about. And I ask people to do that individually first. And then once they've done that, we take all that information, bring the team together, because strategy decisions are almost always leadership team focused, and then we go ahead and draw consensus. And that consensus is basically, do we all that the, these are the good and bad things for each of these alternatives? And then once you've done that, then what we do is we say, okay, now that we've got this census on how we rate each of these alternatives, which is the best one. Now, the reason why I do individual first and group second mm -hmm. is what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to get each executive to take a stand. Mm -hmm. And usually what happens is, is that if, if you ask an executive to think through something and put something down on paper, they're going to defend their logic. Most of these mm -hmm. people are not particularly shy. Mm -hmm. So what I'm trying to do is by getting them to take a stand, I want them to introduce their perspective in the team and then educate others on their perspective. And then we kind of go back and forth and hopefully the entire team benefits from these different perspectives and then we make better decisions. Wow. It's a, it's a several step process, but going yeah. through each, each level really gets you a clearer understanding of where your business really is completely. So yeah, I find this totally fascinating, Steve. I would love to have you come back and talk more deeply on this. This is such a fascinating topic. Before we go, let everyone know where they can find out more about you, get your wonderful books. Sure. The best way to learn more is to go to my website, and that's stevegarko.com 
So it's Steve, G-A-R-C-H-O-W. This also has a free strategic decision assessment survey, which companies can use to see if they are having problems with strategic decision making. And it contains a link to my book on Amazon and ex explains the assistant programs my company can perform. Wonderful. I want to thank you again, Steve, to, for coming on Savvy Business Radio and sharing your valuable wisdom today. Well, thanks very much for having me, Christina. Christina.